How would you like to learn how to think about stocks that gap lower after a news event? There are really only three trading patterns that occur after a stock has a large gap after a news event. In this video, I'm going to give you a framework on how to think about those setups and how to trade them. My name is Steve Spencer. I've been trading for over 20 years. I'm a partner at a proprietary trading firm in New York City, SMB Capital, where we teach traders how to trade stocks, futures, and options from scratch. If you're interested in learning the topic that I discuss in today's video more in depth, there's a two-hour free webinar where I spend about 30 minutes going through the process of finding these setups and my stock selection process. When news is released on a stock, you're typically going to open at a price very different from the prior close. And that's because the market is anticipating that because of this news catalyst, many people are going to want to get out of the stock and it will open at a much lower price. And then there's really only one of three things that are going to happen at this point. There's going to be a large bounce. Buyers are going to step in, they're going to aggressively buy the stock, and it's going to move very quickly to the upside and move to much higher prices. That's one scenario. The second scenario is people will come in, they'll buy not as aggressively, and there will also be sellers after the open that are willing to sell at these new lower prices. So maybe you'll have a little bit of a bounce, and then the stock will trade in a range. This is probably the most common pattern that we see um, with stocks that gap lower on news catalysts, where we establish a trading range. And then the third pot pattern is there is no bounce, or maybe there's a small bounce, and then it takes out the morning lows and trends down for the day. So those are the three basic patterns. Big bounce, kind of little bounce range, um, or downtrend for the day. And so what I do for myself when, the, when a stock has a news catalyst is I go through a bunch of different criteria. I look at both technical and fundamental thing, criteria, and I develop a mental model, a framework on how to look at these things. And that's what we're going to talk about throughout the video today, and I'm hoping that this framework you can perhaps adopt for yourself and it'll make it a little bit easier for you, for you to trade these setups. So developing a mental model. So here are some of the things that I'll look at going into the news event. Was the stock bought or sold before the news catalyst? And quite often, the news catalyst is earnings. Um, and were people positioning themselves on the long side, getting long the week before earnings or, or selling into earnings or perhaps getting short into earnings? That's one of the things that I'll factor into kind of my mental model, how to assign probabilities for the three different scenarios that I just discussed. The next one is what is the bigger term trend? Is it on the longer time frame? Is, it, is the stock been trending higher? Has it been trending lower? That's another criteria that I'll look at. The third thing is what is the most likely trading range? If something gaps lower, is it coming into longer term support? Okay, that's something where I can establish the bottom of potential trading range. And if it bounces, you know, what are the areas prior to today, in the prior weeks, maybe the prior couple of months, where there was an area where it broke out from previously, or there was an area where there was a pivot high? And that's going to give me per perhaps my initial trading range. Or perhaps the reaction after the initial negative event came out and it traded lower and tried to bounce in the after hours, that will give me the top of a potential trading range. And so I'm going to look, come up with these different look at these different technical indicators, or price indicators, I should say, to give me a likely trading range. Um, and then another criteria I may look at is the type of surprise with the news. Is, the, is this an earnings surprise? Meaning, was the earnings expected to make a dollar a share and they reported a dollar thirty and it's a very large upside surprise? Or they were expected to make a dollar a share and in this case, we're talking about stocks that gap lower, so it's unlikely that we would see. The one scenario you'd see where you'd have upside earnings where then it would gap lower would be they beat this quarter, but then they guide it down for the next few quarters and for the year. That's not that uncommon, actually. Um, and then the guidance was the final point, which I was going to say is the guidance going forward is quite often going to lead to large downside moves as well. And that's, you know, they, you always hear the expression, the market is forward looking. So they'll report a number for the quarter, and that's what just happened the prior three months. But then, um, and then you'll see this quite often in the after hours where the stock spikes up, and it spikes up a few dollars, and then an hour later it's $10 lower. And that's because the guidance 
going forward, the firm says, oh, next quarter we're expecting to earnings to not be that good. And then for the, next, for the fiscal year, they're expecting things to not be particularly good. And because the market is forward looking, um, you see that, that, that downward move. And depending on these other things that we've listed in terms of criteria, this is going to impact how we how we're going to develop our mental model coming into the day following the earnings. So what I'd like to do now is look at three different stocks and kind of go through and, and kind of look at some of the criteria. And then when we zoom into the particular trading day after the news event happened, I'll actually assign percentages to trading range, um, bounce, large bounce, or continue to the downside, trend to the downside. Um, and the cool thing about this is when I assign these probabilities, um, these are probabilities based on going through my process of looking at the longer term chart, looking at how people are coming in position to the event, um, and then how are things are trading in the after hours in the pre-market. What I will do, um, once the market opens and tons of orders flood in and millions of shares trade, I will actually update in real time my, my own mental models and I'll change those percentages and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And, and this is known as um, Bayesian statistics. It's, it's, you're, you're assigning a probability to an event and then as you take in new information, you're adjusting those probabilities. And I, and I find this extremely helpful um, in terms of my own trading. And we'll get into that when we get to the point where we look at when we drill down into the, the kind of the probabilities. Well, I'll talk a little bit about how, why, and how that can be so helpful. So the first stock we're looking at is Netflix. The two months coming into earnings, it was actually extremely strong. Um, it trended up from around $340 a share um, to 420, where you can kind of see it, it went vertical there, pulled back into the kind of the trend, um, went up again to 420, and then failed. And so, but it was in a, in a longer term uptrend coming into the earnings event. If we look at it in kind of the most recent, I would say month or so, um, the average person who was long this stock coming to earnings was probably long from around $400 a share, maybe a little bit below that, but, but from pretty high prices compared to where it started a couple of months ago. As I said, it was a strong trend coming to earnings, many people long from 390 plus, um, and then the news comes out and they missed. I don't think that no one was expecting a miss. If you're reading kind of the whisper numbers, you're reading the analyst reports, everybody was thinking Tesla's awesome. You know, coming in, even coming into earnings, people were raising their price targets. Everybody was bullish and they missed um, and, and caught people off guard. And so it was an unexpected thing. And so it, it came off very quickly. We'll take a look at the, the lower time frame chart. Um, and my thought process was after the prior quarter, when it had gapped higher, um, 330 had kind of been where it gapped to and had some resistance to, in the days following earnings. And as I said, and I, recently it just double topped in that two month chart coming into earnings. So we had kind of a 420 top, a lot of people along this in the high 300s, and we had, we had an after hours reaction where it came down um, into the low 340s and the pre-market had bounced to 360 um, and kind of set up a range for us, which was the after hours low, the pre-market high, um, and my thought process basically was this. They were beating every quarter, or, or the, let's say the last four or five quarters coming into this quarter. It had just run up last quarter. We had gapped from, I think, around 290 to 315 or something, ran up to 330, failed there, went back down to 290, broke out from 330, and then trended up those $90, which I showed you on the two-month chart. So we had a, a stock that last quarter reported good numbers, had run up a ton in terms of a percentage basis, and now finally had a negative catalyst. So the way that I looked at this was, was a low probability event that it would trend up and break out of this pre-market range to go to the upside. I actually assigned it a 20% probability. So I assigned a 30% probability that it would trade in the range from 340 to 360, and then a 20% probability that it would break that, that the, the low there and maybe move down to 330 or lower um, the significant price from last quarter after it had gapped up. And so those, those were the initial percentages kind of based on all of those criteria that we just went over. And this was my mental model. And the reason why this is important from my perspective is because I have a very low probability that it's going to have a big bounce, I'm going to be cautious. Um, and so when it's moving higher on the open, um, I may get long, but until it shows me that it can actually hold above the top of that range that I've assigned from the pre-market trading range, I'm going to 
be very cautious and not, not be aggressive at all for the large bounce play. And, and then in terms, of, in terms of the downtrend, because I have a little bit of a higher probability there um, than the uptrend possibility, if it gets below 340 on the open, I'm going to be more aggressive, actually get bigger on the short side, because I, I see there being um, there are more downside on the trade. Now, as you can see, since when we're doing this video um, after the trading event happened, you can see that my probabilities I assigned um, probably, in retrospect, didn't look particularly good um, because the lowest probability I had was that big move back up to 380, the low 380s, and that's actually what ended up happening. Um, so let me just talk to you a little bit about kind of when the market opened, my thought process and how I, I kind of changed those probabilities a little bit. So the market opened, um, and you can see in the pre-market it came off from 360 down to the low 340s. When the market opened, the first move was down. It did come down to around 342, 343, but it quickly catches a bid and then moves back above 350. Now we're looking at the 30 minute here, so we're not gonna even drill down, but the first thing I noticed was it didn't even test the after hours low. So I was like, the chances of it trending lower, I, maybe I lowered that percentage a little bit, maybe to 25%. Then when it actually had the big up move straight to 360 in the first 30 minutes, I, I moved my probability up for the larger bounce from like 20% in my mind to 30%. So I felt a little bit more, I still was skeptical, but I was like, okay, it very quickly went to 360. I'm like, maybe it'll just pop above 360 a little bit. It'll fail there and then it'll just kind of trade in, the, in between 352 and 360 for a while or something like that. But what happened was after 10 o'clock, it then popped up to the mid 360s, it then, then pulled back, did a test. You can't see it on 30 minute, but what it did was it pulled back, did a quick retest of the 360 level, which was the pre-market high, and then started to move above 365. At that point, I was like, we're most likely going up to at least you know, 370, 375, um, and this thing is a, is a pretty strong long. And so, again, initially, I thought it was going to break to the downside. Um, because the first big bar was to the upside, it wasn't like a little bit of a bounce from 342 to like 348 and a failure. I upgraded, you know, I, I increased my mental model where my percentages were a little bit higher. It got me more cautious in terms of the short because of how big that first green bar was. And yeah, I did give it a shot on the short side initially when it got close to 360, but I was cautious because of the size of that move um, and how quickly it happened. And I adjusted kind of my mental, my mental framework and the fact that it happened you know, closer to, to 10 o'clock where things tend to trend a little bit more. So the, 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 this is the first example. Um, this is one where there was expectation that um, it would trend down and it actually did quite, quite the opposite. So here we're looking at the Facebook um, ahead of earnings. It was bought up kind of a week or two in head of earnings. It moved up above 200. And then you can kind of see it had two big up days um, out of like the week before earnings, one which took it from like 200 to 210, and then another one which took it from 210 to 216. So people were very bullish coming into earnings. Then if you look even at the longer time frame, kind of the last couple of months coming into earnings, the stock traded from 180 all the way up to to 210, and then right before earnings, those few days we just looked at, was people were more bullish there. So that's the setup. Um, strong uptrend, two months coming into earnings, 20% um, um, gap down when the negative, they have the negative conference call. And then this is the first conference call. I don't recall them really having a bad conference call in the last five years. I feel, I mean, I just don't remember them having a bad conference call. This is going back to like 2013 or something. Um, and you know, people were a little bit disappointed in the earnings and it would gap below, I think, 200 initially. But then on the conference call, they said some things in terms of going forward over the next few years where they talked about slowing revenue growth. And these are things that I think most people expected was gonna happen at some point. But the disappointing numbers combined with them being negative going forward to talking about them spending a lot more money to police the website in terms of the fake content and the, all this and that. And so their margins were gonna contract. Um, this thing traded in the after hours down to 165. Now, in my mind, that seemed like an overreaction. Um, um, so coming in the next morning when it was above 170, I kind of, the, the range that I came up with was kind of 180, 
kind of best case. We came in the next morning. It had gone down to 165 in the after hours. It was already above 170 in the pre-market. So the, the initial range that I came up with was kind of support 168 to 170. I love the 168 level because that was the level um, when it got hammered because of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, Zuckerberg came out one day and said, oh, we haven't seen any downtick in advertising. The stock ripped above 168, held, and that was the beginning of the uptrend to like 180, 190. Um, so the fact that it was like right above there in the pre-market, I just love the idea of buying into that. And then at the same time, um, I thought that the news was bad enough and the fact that there was a bad conference call and the fact that you saw these headlines, like this headline here that I, gra that I screen grabbed, Facebook's stock plunge shatters faith in tech companies invincibility. Like that was like, I don't even know what that was from, maybe the Wall Street Journal or something. Um, I feel like, you know, these institutional investors, they're just like everybody else. When they see the stock drop 25% um, or 20% in the after hours, they're going to get nervous. And when they see that thing, you know, pop back up in, in the, when the market opens into the 170s or back up to 180, enough of them are going to be scared and be selling that it could roll over again. And so the initial range I came up with was kind of based on the 180. That's where it broke down with on the last bad news in March on the Cambridge Analytica. And then I had my 168 kind of had it when it had bottomed in the 150s and then broke back to the upside. That's where it broke out from. And so that was my initial range. I assigned a fairly high probability there. Um, I thought most likely it would stay in that range. I gave it a very low probability that it could break through there uh, to the upside and um, a very low probability that it could break to the downside as well. I, I really thought it was going to be stuck in this range um, for a couple of days before it made its next move. And so what happened was right on the open, the buy imbalance came in. Um, it popped to the top of our range. It got hammered. And it, it never quite, you know, it came kind of to the middle of the range and then made a little bit of a lower high and then kind of closed right in the middle of the trading range. And this is what happens most times, by the way. Most times when you're doing your mental model, most stocks that have large gaps, they establish a trading range. And, you know, it's, it's probably more than 50% of the time. And so there's a small chance that it will break out of that range and, and move to much higher prices. And there's a small chance it will break out and move to much lower prices. And so that's why if you can get good at identifying key potential support and key potential resistance, you can, you can really capture, capture these ranges. And so, and, and again, this, this idea of the selecting of the stock, developing the pre-market plan, um, I spent about 30 minutes in the two-hour workshop. If you click on the link below the video, that takes you to the two-hour workshop. Um, I don't have as much time to get into the details in these short videos, but that'll walk you through kind of the process of how to find the stock and then come up with a detailed plan for identifying the levels, et cetera. And then the other two parts of the workshop are, are kind of then once you have that plan for that day, there's going to be two more unfolding types of setups. I talk about one of those in great detail and then Mike Bellafuri does the other one. So if you enjoy the video, um, check that out. So the final example that we have today um, is NTRI. And so NTRI, um, what we're looking at here is the few days coming into earnings. This stock actually was sold three days in a row coming to earnings. What does it mean when a stock is sold three days in a row coming to earnings? It means people are concerned about the earnings release. And so this is really good information. And so I, I, I actually like this, of the three stocks I talked about in this video, I like this, this setup probably the most, even though it's like kind of the lower price stock, the least less sexy than the other two. Um, but you'll see as we go through the kind of the criteria. So it was sold ahead into earnings. Um, people thought perhaps the number wasn't going to be that good. Here are my notes from the written game plan that, we, that I released before the morning meeting, which goes along with the morning meeting. And, you know, the numbers, you can see my little note there, the numbers were solid. And so I love, so we're already building our case for this stock. The numbers were solid. It was already sold ahead earnings. And now it's gapping down in after the earnings. And so this is, this is quite very nice, a nice setup. Oh, and then the other thing is it's gapping into the May, late May, early June support. So if you look at it over the last couple of months, it had trended up from the mid 30s into the low 40s. And, and the, the earnings release comes out. You can actually see on this two month chart where it had sold off from around 41 and a half to uh, $36 in front of earnings. And then it was gapping in the pre-market, but it wasn't doing a lot of volume. And so kind of my eyes lit up like, wow, look at this. 
it's gapping into the May June support. The numbers are fine. And then on the, from a bigger picture perspective, um, if you look at the longer term chart, this is a stock that's down um, quite a bit quite a bit. It's down 30% on the year. So you have a stock that had just bottomed longer term, was trending up into this report over the prior two months. Um, the numbers are fine. It's still, you know, in the mid-30s, which is well below the kind of the, you know, if you look on the longer term chart, the most recent highs, which was around $50. Um, it's the second strong quarter in a row. The reason why the stock bottomed, it was kind of bottoming on the long term chart. It gapped up last quarter, so now they have two good quarters in a row. It's gapping down into the May June support, and they had solid earnings. And so if you look at how I was kind of game planning this, um, I had a very, very low probability that it could break to the downside and had, a, you know, had my usual high probability for it to be range bound, but a, but a higher than normal probability that it could break to the upside and trend higher. And so because of those criteria that I just went over and because of this mental framework that I've set up and the percentages are very low that it was going to break to the downside, I was very um, aggressive in terms of on the long side, on the open. Um, if I thought, like if this was a Netflix situation where I thought it had a higher probability of breaking to the downside, um, I'm less likely to be aggressive on the long side. I'll be smaller on the long side. But in this case, I'm going to be more aggressive on the long side. And then I'm going to look for a bounce right on the open and then some sort of kind of consolidation above the opening low and then some sort of trend. And so if we look at this you know, intraday, you can kind of see once it puts in the low right on the open, it has the big pop, it gets very tight, and then it trends for the rest of the day, or I should say for the next couple of hours, where it takes out our resistance and starts to trend. Um, and then we actually use this for the next two days going forward, which was um, if it pulled back in and test kind of those top two bars there pulled in, um, and somebody actually asked me in, in, in the chat, like two days later, hey, Steve, is the 38 level still operative? It pulls in. I think it was gapping lower, the market was down or something. I said, absolutely. I've already got my script in to buy it into 38 because if I can pick it up there, I think it'll trend right back up to the highs and perhaps you know, move to higher prices. Um, and so this was really helpful. This particular stock, the mental framework was helpful to remind me that it was a good long coming into support. If it started to move higher, look to, for spots to get more long. If it gets actually to the resistance area, which was if you go to the notes, it was um, 38 to the high 38s into 39. Be careful about shorting it at that top blue line because it was it had decent potential to break out. And you can kind of see when it got there, it hesitated at first and then it trended up another $2. Um, so that's another way to use kind of those percentages of how you're adjusting your mental, your mental model. Um, so here's our recap. Establish your initial bias with your mental models, looking at all these different criteria I went over for the, for the three stocks we looked at. Have a fully developed plan before the market open. That way when things are quick on the open, you kind of understand what you want to do. Um, if you have the ability to use technology, if you're trading on a platform like TradeStation or, or IB, then absolutely pre-program in so you can cover more stocks on the open. Um, understand exactly what the dollar amount you want to risk prior to entering the trade. This is something we always remind new traders and even experienced traders on our desk. Understand what percentage of your daily stop you want to risk on the trade. This generally will keep you out of trouble. It will be part of your detailed trading plan. Um, and then also the final thing, which I talk about in a lot of the videos, is understand when the trade is working. You know, it may be something as simple as it dropped into your support on the open and by 10 o'clock it was a half of an ATR above your initial entry. That, if that's your confirmation, then look for a spot to add to the position um, to take advantage of the trade working. And also it goes vice versa. If the trade is not working, then you're going to look to lighten up and you know, maybe tighten up your stops. So I, this is how I've done this for a long time. I develop a mental model. I assign the percentages. There are really only three basic types of things that are going to happen when a stock gaps down. If you can assign probabilities to these different scenarios, it's going to allow you to be more um, confident in how you trade these setups. <laughs>